50. But if you'll turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to continue through. Today we're looking at the men. And of course, it's a playoff uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, which says, Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a constant filling of the Holy Spirit. And you will not be able to love your wives as Christ loves the church unless you are filled with the Holy Spirit and you're continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? And so last week we looked at wives. You can go online and you can check that out. This week we're going to pick on the men a little bit here. Not a little bit, but a lot. So um, if you would look with me in verse 24. Well, let's start in just, we'll just start in 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word. He did, not, he did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever has hated his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. God, we so desperately need you. We look around at our culture and marriages are being blown apart on a daily basis. Satan has gotten in there and dis- with his mission statement to rob, kill, and destroy, and he's been destroying families and marriages and people. And so, God, we want to look into your word because we know your word is truth and your word has everything we need for life and godliness. So this morning, Lord, would you open up the eyes of our understanding? Would you help us men love our wives well? God, sometimes us us men are S-L-O-W, Lord. We're slow. We don't get it. But your word says that we can understand our wives. So would you help us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. My hope is today that we would just keep it simple. Last week we looked at if we obey the word, then what happens in our lives? God blesses our relationships. He blesses our marriages. He blesses our parenting. God gives us this instruction because it's extremely important. It's extremely important to help us have healthy relationships in everything that we do. And so God gives us these things. He says, first, the simplicity of it is wives, submit and respect, right? And husbands, love, honor, and understand. And if we're going to be like Jesus, then we're also going to have to add the word die. (laughs) Men are to die. Die to themselves and consider their wives and others more important than themselves. And Paul also sums it up in Colossians where he says, wives submit to your own husbands as is fitting to the Lord and husbands love your wives and do not become bitter towards them. And the sad thing is, is a lot of marriages, there's so much bitterness and unforgiveness, a lack of grace and a lack of mercy. But the problem with that is, is Jesus has poured out his love, his grace, and his mercy in our lives. And if we're to be like Jesus Christ, then we need to pour love, grace, and mercy out upon our wives or even our husbands. Right? It's sad to say, obedience to these two commands is lacking. But the problem is, is disobeying these two commands will only bring an unfruitful marriage. Now men, okay, I'm going to try to help us out here. The Bible says that wives are the weaker vessel. That's what the Bible says, right? I mean, uh, they're, they, they're, they're, they're kinder. They're more compassionate. They're, they're, they're caring. They're, they're, they're even more patient. Otherwise, they wouldn't be married to you, right? I mean, think about it for a minute, you know? 
And, and so the Bible says that they are, but you know, we know that, 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 the, that life deals hard hands. Some women, when, when we marry them, as my English pastor buddy used to say, and don't take offense to this, these aren't my words, doesn't matter which one you marry, God, they all got more baggage than Delta Airlines. You notice the men are laughing, but the women aren't, right? That's not my quote. <laughs> but, but I look at it like this. God gave me my wife, a dove with a broken wing, right? And it's my job. I can do one of two things. I can help her learn how to fly. I can, I can heal the broken wing, and I, can, and, and I can help her to fly and become all that God has created her to be, or I can stomp on the other wing. And sad to say, in the body of Christ, even I see men time and time again stomping on the other wing, never allowing their wives to become all that they can be in Jesus Christ, not allowing them to fly. And I know that life is hard. Life deals hard hands. I mean, a lot of women come in with so much. So, you know, they, they, they've been abused. They've been lied to. They've, they, they, they've had an abortion. They've given up their purity. Uh, uh, they've had their purity taken from them from some jerk. And, and they come in and, they, and, and maybe they have daddy issues or whatever. The dad didn't love them like he should have loved them and cared for them and been there covering. And, and, we, and we see these, these people, and it can happen to men too. Don't get me wrong. We see people and they're broken and they're hurting. Life is hard. Life can deal them hard. And so what happens is, is, it, is a response mechanism. Women build a castle around their heart. They say, you know what? I'm not getting hurt again. I'm not going to allow this man to have all my heart. I'm going to hold back part of my heart because I am sick and tired of being hurt and crushed and used. And so we come and we look at this scripture and we say, okay, if I want to get through that castle, if I want to get over the moat, if I want to get into her life and make her feel like she is worth more than anything, because where your treasure is, gentlemen, there your heart will be. We have the greatest opportunity and responsibility to break down those walls. To love our wives as Christ loves the church. And if you ever doubt how Christ loves the church, all you have to do is look at the cross where he was beaten, where he was tortured, where he was, had the wrath of God and the sins of the world poured out upon him. And he did it for his love for the church. And so here's the picture right there, right in front of us in Ephesians there, that wives are the bride and the, the man is the bridegroom. And the bridegroom represents Jesus, which is us men. And for me, it's easy to submit to Jesus because I see his great love for me. But many of you men don't act like Jesus. Jesus. And so then it becomes difficult for the women to respond as we respond to Jesus because he is so madly in love with us. But I promise you this, man, if you act like Jesus, they will respect you. If you act like Jesus, they will submit to you. And guys, the thing is, I just don't want you to do. I want you to serve them and encourage them and build them up and not, not make them more insecure, but, get, but take, take their insecurities and make them secure in your love. Because our wives need to feel secure and loved and cherished and honored. Any of you women don't want to feel that way? Raise your hand, please. There you go, men. They want to feel like they are the most important thing in the world. i got to ask you this question. Does your wife feel special? Does your wife feel honored? Does she feel cherished? Does she feel loved? Here's another one. Does she feel safe?
Does she feel safe with you? Because, man, if we get this backwards, if we don't get this right, your marriage will be a disaster and not a blessing. Now, how do you know when you love your wife enough? Well, for starters, she says, honey, I can't stand it. Stop loving me. You're just kidding. You're killing me with your love. How many of you men have heard that? Raise your hand. I didn't think so. <laughs> right? Right? Just stop it. I can't handle all your love. I can't handle all your blessing. You just got to stop it. Now, we don't hear that, right? Right? I mean, I, how many of you men purpose in your heart to daily love your wives? I mean, here's the interesting thing, right? I mean, I love to, first thing out of my mouth is usually, I love you, honey, okay? And then, how many of you put sticky notes on all over the house, I love you? I used to write, um, I love you, an XXOO with my wife's eyeliner on the mirror, uh, mirror, and then I went to the Mac store one day with her, and I found out how much it cost, and I said, okay, I'm done with that, sticky notes. Yeah, that's just... <laughs> <laughs> it's too actually she's worth it but you know what i'm saying right how many of you text your wives on your way to work how many of you text your wives when you get to work how many of you text your wives or call her on your lunch break tell her that you love her and that you care about her and that you th you're thinking about her that you'd rather be with no one else on the in the whole world than her I challenge you, man. How many, when's the last time you brought her flowers or set, set up a date night with her? Or set up a trip out of town with her? Eight kids, it gets a little harder and harder for that, by the way, just saying. But we got the sit first five kids because we did that. We went on date nights. And said. Here's my point. And here's the thing about ladies. You can do all those things, yet if you get lost in the football game and you're staring at the TV and, and you might have done all those things and you built up all this capital and all this, 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 this uh, 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 thing that you have going on here and then you totally, absolutely ignore her while she's talking to you, the first thing that she's going to do is think that you don't love her. So it's a continual thing. Just like be being filled with the Spirit is a continual thing. Loving your wife like Christ loved the church is a continual thing. You can't do it for a week and then take a week off. It doesn't work that way. Jesus never takes a day off. Loving you, being there for you, being an advocate for you, interceding for you to the Father in heaven. He never ceases with his grace, his mercy, his unconditional love for you. And that's what he is saying here in Ephesians. He's saying, men, you are to be just like me. And the way I treat the church, you are to treat your wives. Of course, Jesus does tell us the truth, right? And they thrive out of our love. So... If you want to see your wife blossom, love her unconditionally, constantly, and continually. And guys, I've seen marriages that are in complete shambles, and I've challenged men to do this. And I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Fireproof, but if you haven't, you should probably go watch it. But, but the, the biblical principles, I've challenged men to love their wives unconditionally, to serve them, to, to do the things. You know, you know what? It, this, this one boggles my mind, but I understand it, it, that it blesses my wife. I don't know why you make a bed that you're going to get back in the, that night. It just doesn't make any sense to me, right? But my wife likes the bed all cute and, and everything. So, so I, I help her when I can, right? I, I, I'm horrible at it, right? My wife loves to spend time with the horses, so I take time out of, out of my schedule when I go out and spend time with her while she's with the horses. It's not always easy. I don't really... I got other stuff to do, right? But it blesses my wife. If, if your wife wipes the cap on the toothpaste, it's not that hard to screw the cap on the toothpaste, guys. If she likes the counter wipe down when there's water on it, how hard is it to wipe the counter down? 
And so you serve your wife. You find out, and we'll look at it in a couple of weeks, uh, that we can understand and honor and dwell with our wives when we look in 1 Peter. But guys, you, 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 you need to understand your wives. You need to care enough to care. You need to care enough to try to find out what blesses your wife and then do it. And, and guys, what will happen is, is they begin to blossom, they begin to flourish, they begin to, they begin to, to, to walk around in joy, and, and, and they're a joy to be around because women are responders. They will respond to your love. They will respond to your service. They will respond to you dying to yourself, picking up your cross, denying yourself, and following Jesus. I promise. And Jesus went to the cross anyways. Garrett, if Paul knew my wife, he wouldn't have wrote these words. I've heard that, right? And I, I look at him and I say, are you serious? And I, I guarantee you, you're not loving your wife as Christ loved the church. Because there's no way you would say that if you were doing your part. If you were building trust in unconditional love and unconditional grace. And we don't appreciate the cross sometimes. What do you mean, Garrett? I appreciate the cross. Well, if you appreciated the cross of Jesus Christ and you understood the cross of Jesus Christ and you understood his unconditional love, then I can promise you this. You would treat your wife differently. Mark my words on it. Is anything more important to you than your spouse besides God? Is anything more important to you besides besides your relationship with Jesus and, and God the Father than your relationship with your spouse? If it is, then you are absolutely missing it. I don't care if it's your job, if it's your kids, if it's your friends, your hobbies, your sports, even your ministry, because ministry can be the subtle mistress. Verse 23, I'm going to read it again. It says this, it says, Because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, he is the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water of the word. I want to read a scripture about Jesus and his bride. In Revelation 19.7, it says, Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, pure, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saint. That he said to me, Write, Blessed are those to, excuse me, Blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. He said to me, These words of God are true. So we're in this covenant relationship. And what does he say here? He says, I make my bride clean, right? I keep her pure. I wash her in the water of the word. Matter of fact, he goes on to say later on, he says, so there's no wrinkle or spot or anything like it that she is pure and blameless before me. Now, I do that for the church. And men, if you're supposed to be a picture of the church, then what does that say to us? And guys, if you're single, we're going to be looking at singleness in two weeks, relationship, widows and singleness. Ladies, pay attention. If this man is not acting that way right now before you marry him, run. Get as far away from him. Well, I can change him. No, you can't. You know how many times I've heard that? But I, I'm just going gonna, gonna to minister to him, and I'm going to change him. Ladies, that is the biggest lie from the pit of hell I've ever heard in my entire life. You will never change. If he's a knuckle dragger now, he'll be a knuckle dragger in 10 years. Amen. 
if he is loving you and serving you and keeping his hands off of you until you're married, then he might be a man that you want to follow. My wife and I didn't kiss till we were married. A man's got to know his limitations. There's a very good reason that I didn't kiss till my wedding day because I knew that kissing beans my past and her past would lead to other things. And so I had accountability. I had my buddy call. Oh, this is for next two weeks from now. Never mind. Let's switch sermons. Back to this one. Men. Men. I love the... Uh, uh, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert got married, and um, they were married, and uh, this, is, this is hilarious, but they got in a fight the first couple months of their marriage, and he goes into his room and locks the door, and she comes and she pounds on the door, she says, open up, and he's like, who is it? The Queen of England! He doesn't say anything. Goes and pounds on the door again, yeah. Open the door. Who is it? Queen of England. He doesn't say anything. Finally, she knocks on the door and he goes, Who is it? It's your wife. And he opened the door. That's a beautiful illustration, right? And God, I don't know what God's doing in all of your life, but you know, here's the hypocrisy that I see all the stinking time in marriages at work you're you're jolly john you're joe christian at church you're 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 stanley saint right you're 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 you're, you're holy how you're generous gene i don't know whoever you are right you're like this ha yo (laughs) thus thou if i'm so holy But at home and with your wife, you're give him hell, Harry. Arrogant, angry Al. Stupid Steve. Whatever it may be. I I mean, it could be anything, right? Violent Vince or Monster Mike. And you have this like facade in front of everybody else at work. Everybody thinks, oh, here comes Joe Saintly Christian. How you doing? But at home, you're completely and totally something different. If I was to ask your kids, if you, you men love your wife as Christ loves the church, what would they say? What would they say about their father? Would they, would they see? Because here's what's going to happen in a marriage, guys, and I'm telling you right now. The way they see you treat your wife is the way they're going to allow themselves to be treated. And now I can stand and I can say, okay, if, if, if my kids now get into a marriage that's unhealthy and dysfunctional and so on, it's not going to be because of my wife's and my relationship. And, and, and it's crazy because here's the thing I see in some men. Like, like he's out there, he mows the lawn, he doesn't have any oil in his lawnmower, and the, and the lawnmower blows up, and he comes in, he's like, oh, the lawnmower blew up. And, and, and she's like, oh, what happened? I, well, I ran it without oil, and, and ah, it's no big deal. And she's like, well, aren't they like $400? Yeah, but, eh, you know, things happen. It's mechanical, right? And then she burns dinner or does something wrong, and you lose it. And you have absolutely no grace for her. And she walks on eggshells and rice paper around you. And and, and everything is flipped. You can get away with murder, but she can't do one simple thing. And you lose it. And you're cruel and mean. And maybe you even thought, in your mind that she deserved to hear it, right? 
Well, you know what? There's a lot of things that you deserve to hear, but Jesus doesn't tell you that. He continually lavishes his unconditional love upon you, and he continually forgives you for your sin, and he's continually gracious and patient and kind with me, this knucklehead. And guys, we're not perfect. We're going to lose our patience. We're going we're to say stupid things. We're going to hurt our wives. But as soon as you see that happen, then you need to go to her. And the very first thing you need to do is you need to humble yourself and say, would you please forgive me? I was so wrong. Those words I said, I make it a habit if I say something stupid that I'll sit the whole family down and say, the way I just talked to your mom, kids, is absolutely, totally sinful. And will you please forgive me? And my wife and I have this conditional thing that if, if I, I hurt her, she hurts me. We walk up and we put a hand on the other one's shoulder and goes, that really hurt me. And it gives me an opportunity to say, will you forgive me? I love you. Please, I didn't mean it. And maybe even I need to explain, this is what I meant. And, 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 and trust me, in, a, in a, a house with 10 people, six girls, three bedrooms, one bath, seven girls counting my wife, you got to have patience. I tell people I don't have a 401k, I have a 401 wedding. And, and so there's, there's always going to be tension. But if we want our wives to feel secure in our love, then we have to be those men that will constantly love our wives as Christ loves the church. And I, and I see it all the time, men hold things in and they, they get more and more stressed and they get more and more uh, anxious and they, and, and they have more and more problems coming into their lives and, they, and instead of sharing them with their wife and praying with their wife, they, they hold it all back and they, and, and they, they become quiet and they, and they don't say what's going on in their lives and what happens is, is then the wife gets more and more insecure because, you know, why won't he share with me what's going on? Is there somebody else? What's going on? Are there motives? And, and what happens is, is, is this communication and this trust thing breaks down without us even knowing it because we're, we're getting more and more stressed, more and more anxious, more and more fearful, really, more and more angry at, at stuff that's going on in the other parts of our lives. And in our minds, we're thinking we're protecting our wives, but what it's doing, it really doing is it's breaking down a barrier because if the two become one flesh and they're helpmates, then, then we should be able to openly communicate and say, you know what, things are hard at work. Things are, and yeah, they're the weaker vessel. We need to protect them and make sure that they don't get too stressed out and stuff. But we do need to pray together. How many of you men pray with your wives? How many of you men pray with your families? And Paul uses this amazing word right here. It's... it's, it's he could have used so many different words. He could have used storge. He could have used eros. He could have used phileo. He could have used the, the verb for love, agapeo. But instead he chose agape. And that Greek word means unconditional, self-sacrificial love, expecting absolutely nothing in return. It's not a, I love my house, I love my car, I love my dog kind of love. It's not a, I love my buddy it's not even I love my kids, although you should agape your kids. But it's absolutely, totally different. It's not a, I love her when I feel like it. I love, it. I love her when she does the dishes. I love her when she gives me sex. I love her when she earns it. I love her when she cooks dinner for me. I love my wife when she goes to the gym. It's not that at all. It is unconditional all the time. Look at me in verse 25. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church. And here it is, guys. Underline it, circle it. And gave himself for her. He gave himself for her. And if you do not cultivate this type of love in your marriage, you will reap what you sow. And some women are long, more long-suffering and patient than others. Some might be three years. Some it might be five years. Some it might be 10 years. Some it might be 20 years. Some it might be 30 years. But I know marriages that have even broke up when they're in their 70s. After 40, 
50 years of marriage. Let it not be named among us, amen? Let us cultivate healthy relationship. Now, well, we'll get to that next week. On the screen will be 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I know I've shared this before, but I think it's extremely important that we look at this right now. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, it says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Love thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never failed. Now, on a scale of 1 to 10, where do you put yourself right now? I want you to get a number in your mind right now. On a scale of 1 to 10. With your spouse. It can go either way. Now, if you were to ask your spouse... On a scale of 1 to 10, how would she write that down? And I can put my name in here, and it just sounds pathetic, right? I mean, Garrett suffers long in his kind. Garrett does not envy. Garrett does not parade himself. Garrett is not puffed up. Garrett does not behave rudely. Garrett does not seek his own. Garrett is not provoked. Boy, I wish that was true 24-7. Garrett thinks no evil. Oh, my goodness, after this last election. Garrett does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Garrett bears all things. Garrett believes all things. Garrett hopes all things. Garrett endures all things. Garrett never fails. But that is the standard, the agape, the agape that, that, that Paul puts down there for us to measure our love to our spouses. Because there's one person... That is completely 100% love, and that is Jesus Christ. So we could put Jesus in there. We could say Jesus suffers long in his kind. Jesus does not envy. Jesus not per- does not parade himself. Jesus is not puffed up. Jesus does not behave rudely. Jesus does not seek its own. Jesus is not provoked. Jesus thinks no evil. Jesus does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Jesus bears all things. Jesus believes all things. Jesus hopes all things. Jesus endures all things. Jesus never fails. And so what we do, men, is we get as close to Jesus Christ as we can. And we study the Word of God. We memorize the Word of God. We know the Word of God. Because if we're called to wash our wives in the water of the Word, then we must know the Word of God. You cannot wash your wife in the Word of God if you do not know the Word of God, if you are not studying the Word of God, if you're not memorizing the Word of God, and you're not reading the Word of God. It will be literally impossible for you to wash your wife in the water of the Word. If your wife is anxious and worried and stressed out you can go to her and you can say honey you don't you know it says the bible says be anxious for nothing but with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving make your request known to god and the peace of god that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind in christ jesus now let me pray for you so what does it say there honey it says, be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. It says, it, it, it says, it says a, a, and, and make your request known to God. So we're going to do that right now, honey. We're going to make our request. We're going to lay those things at Jesus' feet because they're Jesus' burdens. We don't have to worry about them. But here's the key word there. You see that? It says thanksgiving. So we need to thank God for this trial, but know that he's going to be on the other side of it. And so whether, what about if it's fear? You know, God didn't give us a spirit of fear, honey, but love, power, and a sound mind. What is she struggling with somebody at work? You know, the fear of man, honey, is a snare. And so you, you hide the word of God in your heart. You study the word of God, which is Jesus, really, because in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, right? And so you, you cultivate your relationship with Jesus. And so when it says, wash your wife in the water of the word, then you have the word to give her. And gentlemen, if you're just starting out, you don't even need to do that. You can just read the word with her and let God do it. Pick a, pick a book and go through it and just read with her. And just like Jesus washed the disciples' feet, we're to wash our wife's feet. How do we do that practically? Well, do you spend time with your wife? Do you lay aside everything and, and, and make a day important to her? 
Do you go out and spend time with her while she's with the horses? Do you know what she likes to do and do it with her? How many of you men have, I bet if I asked Larry, Larry, how many times have you been window shopping with your wife? Half a million? 100,000? A lot, right? How many years? 51 years. Do you think he knows? Do you think he knows what his wife likes? <laughs> they wouldn't be married if he didn't. Do you work in the garden with her? Do you shut the TV off for her? Does she think she's the most important thing in the world? Is she your joy and treasure? Have you found out what she likes? Are you patient and understanding? Do you take time to know your wife? Have you taken time to know your wife and find out what is important to her? Do you listen? Do you listen or try to fix it? Are you able to discern tears? Oh, those are angry tears. Oh, those are happy tears. Those are better get out of her way tears. Those are sad tears. Those are sorrowful tears. Most men have no trouble being the knight in shining armor. They'll jump in front of a bullet for their wives, but they won't daily consistently love their wives as Christ loves the church. Because where's the heroic in that, right? Jumping in front of a moving car for your wife is heroic, but loving her and understanding her and being patient with her and loving her unconditionally and listening to her and spending time with her and putting your, her needs above your own, that is not as heroic. That is painful sometimes but God doesn't give us an option my friends you pray with your wife guys he'll fight for your marriage verse 27 he did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that but holy and blameless Sanctified means set apart for holiness. Cleanse her without spot or wrinkle. Do you guard your wife's purity? Do you watch what she watches with you? Do you watch what she reads? Do you protect her? Do you allow things into your home? Do you bring things into your home that are, that are, that are not pure and holy and righteous? Because that, my friends, is washing your wife in the water of the word, but also presenting her blameless to Christ. If you're not blameless, and you're not holy, and you're not righteous, you won't be able to do that for your wife. I, I mean, it's mind-boggling to me. I had this very good friend who was a pastor who, whose wife read cosmopolitan and romance novels. I'm like, dude, you are just cruising for a bruising, bro. Because I guarantee you what that lie says in those magazines and that book, you ain't it. You're not even close to it. Look, you don't have a nine pack like Batman. That dude in the book's got a nine pack and superpowers. And he never makes a mistake. So what, what do you let your watch, wife watch and and see and hear and come out of your mouth and is Jesus honored in your home is your house clean and pure here, here here's the biggest overarching question guys and this is the one I always measure myself by is my wife closer to Jesus because of me because here's what I know and I've seen it a thousand times some wives get closer to Jesus because some silly little man is a drunk and a pervert and mean and nasty and angry and bitter and and everything else and they have nowhere else to go but run to Jesus or leave 
Or the second kind of man, your wife is closer to Jesus because you wash her in the water of the word and you love her and you, and you care for her and you encourage her and you stick the sticky notes on the wall and you plan a, a date night with her and you tell her she's beautiful and you'd rather, you know what, and I can tell you this with an honest truth, if I lost everything, if I lost my house, my ministry, my children, and I was living under a bridge and I was living under a bridge with Bethany, I would be having the abundant life and i mean that i'm not just making this up i mean that from the bottom of my heart does your wife know that does she know that she is your treasure and singles ladies if you're not feeling that now run but he's cute and he has a job Yeah, Absalom was cute and had a job. Satan was the most beautiful angel in the garden. Nobody compared to him. Could it be Satan? <laughs> and trust me, I'm a man. He will tell you everything you want to hear. That's for next week. Never, the week after next. Hey, here we go again. Back to the text. Do yourself a favor, men. Love your wife communicate with them affirm them reassure them let them know that they're the most important thing in the world love them so much that they will never misrepresent anything that you do as rejection because if you don't somebody will it may be a t TV show. It may be uh, some guy on the internet or some guy at work. Oh, man, your husband's the luckiest man that ever lived. And before you know it, they bought it, hook, line, and sinker, and downward spiral it goes. And before you know it, the marriage is a mess, the kids are a mess, and Satan has won. And guys, I don't want to see that happen in this church. I don't want your wife to think. He doesn't think I'm uh, attractive anymore. He is, he's interested in somebody else. He doesn't love me. He wishes he would have married somebody else. Guys, do not, do not, do not, do not go there. And don't be frustrated and aggravated because she will interpret your responses of lack of love. Love her like Christ loves the church. Please. Please. Now, in closing, I want to just point out a few things here. You can change it. If you put Jesus in the center of your marriage and the center of your life, you can change it. There's not a relationship or a marriage that has gone too far that it cannot be repaired. I was sharing this the other night at, at small group. I know two couples where the wife went out because the husband wasn't loving his wife like Christ loved the church. They were addicted to their jobs. They were addicted to their hobbies. And they, were, they, they put the wife bottom of their list and they weren't loving her and they they weren't patient and kind and and loving them unconditionally and so they went out and found love somewhere else now the interesting thing in these two relationships is is they got pregnant by this other guy but the man repented both men repented and they came back to the lord and they began to cultivate their relationship with god and through that period of time they were able to forgive their spouse and they actually adopted both of the parents that i know adopted the kids and gave them their own last name and restored what the locusts have eaten in the marriage and and, and this took a lot of grace and humility and forgiveness and ownership they own that they were not loving their wives as christ loved the church that they weren't putting jesus first that they weren't bringing purity into the home and they weren't washing them in the water of the word and all the things that god says if you do this you will be blessed but god replaced it he restored it and guys no greater love does anyone have than this and he lays down his life for his friends and that is what jesus does 
Verse 28 and 29 says that we're to love them like ourselves, but, but, but what if we actually truly loved our wives as much as we loved ourselves? Could you imagine? My wife knows I'm in it for the long haul, guys. That I will never leave her or forsake her. I won't run off when things get hard. I won't run off when, uh, through thick and thin and sickness and health, richer or poorer. And so I wanted to read our marriage vows to you. They're the ones that we uh, read to each other when we got married. But before I read them, remember these two things when you're, when you're hearing these. Submit to Jesus equals a great marriage and love like Jesus equals a good marriage. But here's what I wrote to my wife. I, Garrett Gropner, with exceedingly abundant, great joy. The same words I tell her all the time. It, with exceedingly great, abundant joy, I am married to you even 17 years later. I take Bethany Grace Fuller to be my precious bride. Bethany, it will be my privilege and extreme blessing to wash you in the water of the word, word all the days of our lives, my precious bride and best friend. I purpose in my heart on this day to love, honor, and cherish you above all others, putting all your needs above my own, that I might present you holy and blameless before our God and Savior Jesus Christ. You are precious and beautiful in my sight. Today I receive you as a gift from God, and you will be my delight always. That word there is hephzibah in the Hebrew it's the word that the Lord gave my wife when she came back to the Lord. He said, Bethany, I forgive you. You are my hephzibah, my delight always. I will never leave you nor forsake you till death do us part. I love you. And I'll say that to you even today. And my wife's Garrett, from the moment I first met you, I wanted to know you more. My spirit leaped within me as I caught, caught a glimpse of the man like no other. That's right. That's right. That's right. You, you guys hear that? You men hear that? Ask her if she'd still say that today. That's the big question, right? Where was I? <laughs> Unique to this world, I knew instantly as I saw your zealous ambition to follow after our Lord that I could not marry any other. I have long since that day to share the rest of my life with you to fulfill my joy in being like-minded and in one accord. Take me as the seal upon your heart and entreat me not to leave you or turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. This is out of Ruth, obviously. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Also, may the Lord do to me and more also, if anything but death ever parts you from me. Does your spouse know that you're in it for the long haul? Does your spouse realize that through thick or thin, sickness and health, rich or poor, till death do you part, that you won't desert or won't run off when things get hard. And I promise this is in closing. I want to read a story to you. And this story is so significant to me because if you look at my wife's left hand, there are ten diamonds on it. Because I wanted a ten diamond wife. And when you hear the story, you'll understand. I wanted her to know that she was the most precious and important thing in my life and that she is my treasure, my delight always. And so here's the story. It says, when I sailed the Kinawato, an island in the Pacific, I took along a notebook. After I got back, it was filled with descriptions of flora and fauna, native customs and costumes. But the only note that still interests me to this day is Johnny Lingo gave eight cows to Sarita's father. 
And I don't need to have it in writing. I remember it as if every time I see a woman being belittle, be, see a woman belittling her husband or a wife withering under her husband's scorn. I want to say to them, you should know why Johnny Lingo paid eight cows for his wife. Johnny Lingo wasn't exactly his name, but that's what Shrinkin, the manager of the guest house in Kinawata, called him. Shrinkin was from Chicago and had a habit of Americanizing the names of the local people. But Johnny was mentioned by many people in many connections. If I wanted to spend a few days at a neighboring island of Nurabandi, Johnny Lingo would put me up. If I wanted to fish, he'd show me where they were biting best. If I wanted pearls, I, he would find me the best buys. The people of Kinawatu all spoke highly of Johnny Lingo. Yet when they spoke, they smiled, and the smiles were slightly mocking. Get Johnny Lingo to find you what you want, and let him do the bargaining. Johnny knows how to make a deal, Shrinkin said. Johnny Lingo, a boy seated, laughed and rocked with laughter. What's going on, I thought. Everybody tells me to get in touch with Johnny Lingo, but then breaks up in laughter when they mention his name. Let me in on the secret. Oh, the people love to laugh, he said. Johnny's the brightest, the strongest, the smartest young man in the islands, and for his age, the richest. But if he, excuse me, but if he's all you say, then what is everybody laughing about? Only one thing. Five months ago at Fall Festival, Johnny came to Kinawatu and found himself a wife. And he paid eight cows? I knew enough about island custom to be impressed. Two or three cows would buy you a pretty good wife. Four or five, the best. Good Lord, I said. Eight cows? She must have beauty that takes your breath away. Well, she's not ugly, he conceded and smiled. But the kind would only call Sarita, the kindest would only call Sarita plain. Sam Crew, her father, was afraid that he'd be on his hands for life. But then, how did he get eight cows for her? Isn't that extraordinary? Never been paid before. Yet you called Johnny's wife plain. I said it would be kindness to call her plain. She was skinny. She walked with her shoulders hunched and ducked her head. She was scared at her own shadow. Well, I said, I guess there's no accounting for love. True enough, agreed the man. And that's why the villagers grin when they talk about Johnny. They get special satisfaction from the fact that the sharpest trader in the island was bested by a dull old Sam Carew. But how? No one, no, one, no, no one knows and everyone wonders. All the cousins were urging Sam to get three cows, hold out for two until, she was sh she, until he was sure Johnny would only pay one. Then Johnny came to Sam Carew and said, Father of Sarita, oh, I'm gonna, still knocks me up every time. I offer eight cows for your daughter. Eight cows, I murmured. I'd like to meet Johnny Lingo. I want a foot, fish. I want some pearls. So next af afternoon, I went to Nar Narabandi. And there were no <clears throat> when I asked for directions to Johnny's house, it brought no sly smile to the lips of his fellow Nar Narabandians. And when I met him, a serious young man, when he welcomed me with grace to his home, I was glad that his own people had his respect with unmingled mockery, with, uh, unmingled with mockery. We sat in his house and talked. Then he, said, then he asked, you come from Kinawatu? Yes. They speak of me on the island? They said, yes. Uh, what do they say? My wife is from Kino Kinawatu. Yes, I know. They speak of her? A little. What do they say? Why just, the question caught me off balance. They told me, you married at festival time. Nothing more? His eyebrows said, showed that there was more. They also say the marriage settlement was eight cows. I paused. They wondered why. They asked that, his eyes lighting with pressure. They, they asked that, his eyes lighting with pressure. Everyone in Kinawatu knows about the eight cows. I nodded. And in Narabandi, everyone knows it too. His chest expanded with satisfaction. Always and forever, when they speak of marriage settlements, it will be remembered that Johnny Lingo paid eight cows for his beautiful bride, Sarita. So that's the answer, I thought. Vanity. And then I saw her. I watched her enter into the room and place flowers on the table. She stood a moment to smile at the young man beside me. Then she went swiftly out again. She was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. The, the, the lift of her shoulders, the tilt of her chin, the sparkle of her eyes all spilled a pride which no one could deny her right. I turned back to Johnny Wingo and found him looking at me. You admire her, he murmured. She, she's glorious. 
But she's not Sarita from Kinawatu, I said. There's only one Sarita. Perhaps she does not look this way. They say in Kinawatu. She doesn't. I heard she was homely. They all make fun of you because you let yourself be cheated by Sam Carew. You think eight cows were too many? A smile slid over his face. No, but how can she be so different? He, Johnny said, do you ever think, he asked, what it must mean to a woman to know that her husband is settled on the lowest price for which she can be bought? And, and then later, when the woman talked, they boast of what their husbands paid for them. One says four cows, another says six. How do you think it feels for the woman who was bought for one or two? This could not happen to my Sarita. Then you did it to make your wife happy. I wanted to make her happy, yes, but I wanted more than that. You say she's different, this is true. Many things can change a woman. Things happen inside, things happen outside. But the thing that most matters most is what she thinks of herself. In Kinawata, Sarita believes she was worth nothing. Now she knows she is worth more than any woman in the islands. I loved her and no other woman. I was close to understanding, he said. I wanted an eight cow wife. I know that story was long, but here's the point. Jesus wanted a bride more than anything else on the planet. And he came and he died and he purchased you with his blood so that you could be with him forever at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You married your bride. Does your wife feel like she's a one cow wife or an eight cow wife or a ten cow wife? We look at Jesus and we say, you know what, I want to be like you because I want to love my wife as Christ loves the church. And friends, that's the beauty of it. If you love your wife as Christ loves the church, she will respond with respect and love and honor and pleasure and a smile. Men, do yourself a favor. Love your wives. Let's stand.